Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to this week's Hope Restored. Thanks for joining us again. And if you're joining us for the first time, you are very, very welcome. We're going to be starting a new series this week from Fresh Life Church, and this is entitled Easter People. And over the next six weeks, we're going to be looking at different people who are involved in the Easter story as we uh, work our way towards Easter 2022. So I uh, hope you can join us on this journey. We've got some really interesting characters to look at, and it's going to be an exciting series. Let me pray, and then we're going to go into worship. Father, we thank you for another chance to listen to your word and for another chance to meet together online. And we pray that you would enrich us through your word, enrich us in the worship and enrich our hearts as we seek to follow after you. In Jesus' name. Amen. So let's worship together. Such peace, Lord, I love you so much. 
thank you for saving me. What can I say? You are my everything. I will sing your praise. You shed your blood for me. What can I say? You took my sin and shame. A sinner called my name. Great is the Lord. Great. I wonder whether you've ever really appreciated just how much God loves you. Let me read these few verses from Colossians chapter one, and this is verse nine onwards. It says this, since the day we heard about you, this is Paul speaking, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. Bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us 
from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins what amazing words and with words like that how can we not continue to worship god forgiven because you were forsaken I'm accepted you were condemned and I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and rose again I'm forgiven because you were I'm accepted Jesus. 
Well, as many of you know, we meet on Thursdays at one o'clock and at eight o'clock, one o'clock in the afternoon, eight o'clock in the evening. And um, we have a live Zoom meeting in the evening on Thursdays after the service. So you can join with us and we can pray for um, things that are going on around the world and pray for each other and support each other. And we can also discuss the message. So do join us for that. The link will be uh, available later on in the service for you to do that if this is Thursday evening when you're watching. Um, we're going to be starting this new series now and this is Pastor Levi Lusco from Fresh Life Church speaking on Easter people and this is the first of six messages. In God's providence, I had, we had been planning to spend the weeks between now and Easter really getting our hearts ready for all that God wants to do in our lives as we remember and look back on the resurrection of Jesus from the dead and to spend weeks in a series that is essentially a collection of talks built on people involved in the Easter story. People involved in the Easter story. There were people involved in the Easter story. And we're going to be looking at a bunch of the different stories. I invite you to, to make sure you don't miss a, a week uh, as each installment will build and show us different angles and, and perspective. And it's going to be amazing. Easter people uh, will bring us through Easter. Who knows? Maybe we'll go weeks past it. It's fantastic. Uh, but we're going to start in Mark's gospel, chapter 16. There's something really, really special that God has shown me. I was actually on an airplane with my wife when uh, this, this came to me. And I, this is unlike me. Uh, the flight landed. I didn't even notice. Um, I had my laptop out. I don't know if the flight attendant didn't notice, but I was still working. And this is how I work. This is how, <laughs> this is how I do it. This is how I write my sermons. Now you guys know. Um, don't have my fingers involved at all. Just, just all wrist. Uh, but, but the flight lands. People are getting off. And Jenny's like, um, like I'm normally like you know totally switched on on a flight, but this time I'm just like just in it, just like headphones on. Just oh my gosh, this is so powerful. And uh, she's like, we need to get off this airplane. And so I like just grab all my things and my phone and like I'm dragging my laptop cord down the aisle. And she's like, you're a mess. It was, I was like, but God showed me something so special. I can't wait to show our church. I really, I'm really excited. I hope you are, I hope you are 5% as excited as I am. At least you're here, baby. Um, all right. So uh, the title is The Show Must Go On. The Show Must Go on. That's a phrase that originated in the circus. And uh, oftentimes, people will get hurt. Of course, circus is dangerous, y'all. Right? I mean, you got trapeze, and you got people walking across a volcano, singing worship songs. I mean, you got anybody watch that? That was awesome. Um, and when someone would get hurt, there was a spirit amongst the performers that we're not going to let a setback keep us from doing what we, were, we showed up to do. We're going to keep going. If I have to be the, 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 the ringmaster tonight, and I was supposed to be the lion tamer, if I have to do that, like no matter what happens, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna give the people who came out what they're here for. The show must go on. And that sort of spirit of never say quit, never, never say die. If we have to adapt, we adapt. We need to adapt. Adapt or die, right? But we're going we're gonna to figure out a way to do what we came here to do. And that spread uh, to the hotel business and restaurant business. And really, um, I think any, any business with a drive and a mission has that sort of uh, up in their tank a little bit. The show must go on. Let's figure this out. Let's not easily walk away. Let's not get discouraged. Let's, let's, not, let's not get jaded. Let's, let's stay sweet. Let's stay, yeah. let's, let's stay spunky. Let's stay hungry. Let's stay foolish. Yeah. Like the show, come on, the show must go on. Yeah. Could you tell two or three people around you without touching them? The show must go on. The show must go on. And I want to show you that it is that spirit that's at the heart of what happened on the day Jesus rose, specifically as we look at Easter person number one, Mary Magdalene. Verse 1, chapter 16, Mark's gospel, it says, now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and the Italian 
salome. <laughs> Brought spices, because it's a spicy salami. <laughs> that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they said among themselves, who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. And the church said, I just talked about Jesus rising from the dead. I said, and the church said, he is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. This is the greatest show. With apologies to the circus, there has never been a greater show than this one. This is the resurrection from the dead. This is the, 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 the linchpin of our salvation. This is the cornerstone of our faith. This is the hope that we will go to the grave with. This is what will bring us through the valley of the shadow of death. This is our victory. The greatest show. Now, I don't know how you, how you react to like me calling the resurrection of Jesus a show. You're like, I don't know, a show's fake, a show. No, no, no. If you look in the dictionary under the word show, you'll see a display, or you'll see one of my favorite words, a spectacle, a spectacle. Paul literally said that when Christ rose, there was a spectacle that took place not only on earth but in heaven, in, in, in the corridors of eternity. And it for sure reverberated through the corridors of hell, too. In fact, Paul put it this way, speaking about the spectacle of the resurrection. He said that at, on the day that Christ died and rose, he took away the weapons of the powers of the authorities. He made a public show of them. Talk about an end zone dance. The devil thought that he had defeated Jesus when he nailed him to the cross. Turned out he pounded those three nails into his own coffin. I'm telling you, when Christ rose from the dead, he stripped demon powers. He stripped the devil of authority and honor. And he dragged them naked and bound. It was a victory parade. This is the greatest show that Christ rose from the dead, a display of power, a spectacle of the enemy who thought he could take us into the grave, who thought he could drag us into hell with him. But Christ grabbed us from the jaws of death. He grabbed us from our sin. He nursed us back to health. He gave us his life. The resurrection of Christ from the dead is our hope. Without it, we are in vain. Without it, we believe in vain. Without it, we gather in vain. Without it, we trust God in vain. It's Christ's victory over death that can give us hope no matter what we face in this life. And guess what? For this great show, Mary had a front row seat. Mary the Magdalene, she had a front row seat. Now, front row seat in our house is, uh, is code for Jenny and I are making out. It all started <laughs> when we were smooching, and Daisy walked around the corner and, and caught, us, caught us kissing. And it's OK, we're married. And, um, <laughs> And she's like, uh, and we're like, uh, and she goes, front row seat. She didn't like it. <laughs> she didn't like it. She did not like it. And so now anytime my kids sense PDA, they just go front row seat. And they're just like, do we need to revert our eyes? And it's, it's Jenny's fault. She's so fine. I'll tell you what, <laughs> right now, um, front row seat. Mary had a front row seat to the greatest show, which is she was, she was, she was the first in line to see it. She got to be a part of it. Mark goes on. We're not going to read his account any further, but he does go on to actually detail her bumping into Jesus. He, he just in a few verses kind of gives, gives, gives the essence of it. But, but she got to have a front row seat. And, uh, and what I want to do is, is talk about why. I want to talk about how. Because if we're not careful, it, it could seem that it was just a lucky coincidence for her. Man, lucky Mary, you know, Magdalene and her friend Salami, they got to see Jesus rise from the dead. They, man, they, it almost seems like they were just in the right place at the right time. And it was sort of this fluke thing. Could have been any of the, 
of, of the disciples, but, but she just got to be the one. And I want to show you that that is not the case, that it was, in fact, the result of a faithful life that led to this, this, this climactic victory. And it's important we talk about that. Why? Because one of the greatest mistakes that, that a leader can make is to only analyze their failures and to sort of uh, assume that the victories will just continue, right? I, I, I for sure know as a leader that uh, I, do, I do forensic analysis of a failure, almost like that lock the doors spirit you know, in a space shuttle disaster. Lock the doors. No, no one's leaving until we understand the failure. Now, it is important to try and assess why you failed in an endeavor, what you did wrong in a business, what, how you mentally broke, and why your team failed to do what they were there to do. We need to look into our failures. But one of the greatest things you can do as a leader is also do an autopsy on a success. Right. And the mistake that you could make is to coast because something went right and to really dig in when something went wrong. But sometimes that can be fruitless. But the better question is, how did we do what we did right so that we can do more of what we did right? You don't get to automatically repeat a victory unless you understand what it was that you did right. All right? So one, one example of this is, is your kid brings home their report card. And you see four Ds and a C and a B. And where do you go as a parent? To the Ds. Ds, what's wrong here? Why, why is this not working? Why, so tell me about the Ds. And we just want to understand, why, why are you not doing good in these areas? Why do you have these Ds? We just focus and harp on the Ds. You're missing the point. There's a B. So they're capable of success. So what about that B? Talk about the B. Dissect the B. Figure out what's, what's, what's happening in the B. And how do we spread what's happening in the B to the D instead of trying to bring the D up to the B? You see, you got to do the autopsy on the successes and not just the failures. So Mary here, I think you'll agree with me, is having a success story. It's a great moment. She's getting to see the empty tomb. She's getting to, she's having an angel encounter. This is an angel encounter. Angel, someone say angel encounter. Angel. That's a big deal, an angel encounter. Epic moment. But how did she get there? Oh, for that, we got to go back to Luke chapter 8. You see, it's her origin story. Every great hero, and Mary Magdalene has been called one of the examples of purer devotion in the entire Bible, by the way. So that's an epic moment. She's flexing her, her, uh, her superhero powers. But the origin story, well, her roots were humble. In Luke chapter 8, we're told, now it came to pass, and this is, by the way, very early on in Jesus' ministry, afterward, that he went through every city and village preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. How did that work? Well, the 12 were with him. When we think of Jesus' support squad, our minds, many of us, automatically go to his 12 disciples. Because the teamwork makes the dream work. And if Jesus is preaching the gospel to every city and getting this, this message and this news out to every place, we know he can't do that alone. The great hallmark of a courageous leader is their ability to empower see greatness in other people, watch their, their, their vision be multiplied through lots of different uh, talented individuals. And we think, well, Jesus is doing an amazing thing. Well, he had to have a team. Absolutely, he had a team. And the 12 were just the beginning. So how did it work that he went everywhere doing all that he was able to do? How is it that the 12 were able to go everywhere and do all they were called to do? For that, we have to keep reading where it says, and certain women. That's how Jesus did what he did. Y'all, certain women. Where am, I, where am I God honoring women at? How is Jesus able to do what he called to do? Certain women. What was their backstory? Who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Well, what about the disciples? We're still hoping they would get healed of their evil spirits and infirmities. But these women had, had been healed and been touched. And they were, they were serving Jesus in a powerful way. What did that look like? Well, Mary called Magdalene out of whom had come seven demons. Now, I don't care how you count. That's a lot of demons, right? The way I reckon any, anything over three is a bunch, you know? Seven demons. This girl was an uh, unholy holiday in. You know what I'm saying? And, and it says, verse 3, she wasn't alone. Mary also had Joanna, the wife of Cusa. I don't know who that is. Oh, it's Herod Stewart. Ah. And Susanna, do not forget Susanna. 
But they weren't alone either, because it says of these women, and there were many others who provided for him from their substance. We tend to focus on, when we think of what Jesus did, the actual boots on the ground, his hand on them, raising the widow of Nain's son, doing this work in this place, doing this in that place. But Luke, who's been called the gospel of womanhood, because he so often brings to our attention the amazing cast of rocking biblical women who served God in powerful ways, he tells us, yeah, Jesus did all this, and his disciples helped him out. But don't you dare forget about Susanna and Mary and all all these rocking women, the mother of Salome, the mother of James, the mother of, of, of John, these women were the ones who said, hey, listen, we'll serve so that you can go. We'll be here doing what's needed so you can do the ministry that you're called to do, Jesus. So for Mary, it wasn't this, this fluke thing that caused her to be able to see Jesus rise from the dead and get to be a part of this, this most important, greatest story ever told. For her, it was a way of life beginning when she started out at rock bottom and Jesus touched her. So now, with that in mind, that she was regularly doing what she did, and that's how she got to be a part of that day, we come to John chapter 20, where we're going to circle back on Mary and read the same story we read a minute ago, but we're going to see it from a different point of view. We, we read Mark's, which is Peter's account. Peter primarily supplied Mark with the information to write his gospel. Because Peter's like, ain't nobody got time for that. So Mark's going to ghostwrite my book, right? <laughs> Classic Peter, right? <laughs> Peter, we need you to write an account of the, what happened. You were right there. He's like, mm, for sure, right on that. Mark, come here. Write some stuff down for me. <laughs> <laughs> and and Mark, Mark gave a very quick, breathy account. Because Peter was like, you know, doing it between like reps on the bench press or something. Like, all right, here's the deal. Here's what happened. What'd you see next? And and Peter, Peter's just like sort of like stream of consciousness, telling Mark what went down. He's called, by the way, the and then gospel, the Mark's Mark's account, because it's so rapid fire and and so all over the place. Because that's Peter, you know, he's ADD. He's like, what happened? Uh, and then we were here. After that, well, then we went over here. And he uses the phrase, and then, so many different times uh, that, that marks, marks uh, the, the perfect gospel for a generation with a 14-second long attention span, right? <laughs> but, but not John. John was poetic. John was, was, was earthy. John went away by himself to a cabin to write his account, actually a prison island and called Patmos. And, and he, he, he liked to be alone, right? And, and he wrote an account that, that employs a lot of you know, symbolism. And he was real clever in how he stitched it all together. He included seven different I am statements, seven you know, different signs that, that Jesus performed. So he was really proud of his, of his gospel. He couldn't work with a ghost writer because he was too much of a control freak and couldn't handle it. I relate to John more than Peter. Um, so, so John's account includes Mary's perspective, but we get a little bit more detail. And I hope it hits you harder now that you know, yeah, she ended with an angel encounter. But her first it, 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 it's time she shows up in the Bible, she was in need of an exorcism because she was full of demons. From the demons to the angels. That's Mary's story. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. That's John's nickname for himself. <laughs> <laughs> Which, by the way, I encourage you to steal it right away. Yeah. Who are you? You're someone loved by Jesus. John so internalized Jesus' love that whenever he talked about himself, he was just like, I'm someone loved by Jesus. Could there be a more powerful way to let your life be summed up than I am someone Jesus loves? Right? What's your story? I'm loved by Jesus. What else? Well, I don't, I'll tell you whatever you want, to, uh, you want to know, but that's the most important thing about me. I'm loved by Jesus. So she tells Peter and John that Jesus is not in his tomb anymore, which is totally not normal. And she said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So she's acknowledging, I'm not alone. I had my, 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 my sheep posse with me, even though John's focusing on Mary's perspective. She says, we don't know where they laid him. So her girls are still with her. Verse 3, Peter therefore went out and the other disciple, 
John, and we and they were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. <laughs> really? <laughs> So John and Peter always had this like rivalry thing going on. And even on the most important day of their lives, John cannot hesitate, but he tells you, I'm faster than Peter. So <laughs> it's not a race, but I got there first. So if you ain't first, you last, Ricky Bobby. And I got there first, is what he is saying. There's a little shake and bake is what happened. Just reading the Bible. What are you looking at? <laughs> and he. Peter, or rather John, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. Then finally, fat boy Peter <laughs> finally showed up following him, huffing and puffing, is what John's trying to get you to see. And he went into the tomb. John's like, I was being respectful. And not Peter. He's just never wanted to desecrate something, just goes clomping in there, didn't even take his shoes off or nothing. John, we get it. You're better than Peter. And he saw the linen cloth lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who got to the tomb first, <laughs> real mature, went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary stood still outside by the tomb, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. I'll take care of it. Just tell me if he had to get moved or something. Let me know. I'll, I'll take care of it. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, or Rabbi, which is to say teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. So now I think you'll agree with me. We have a little bit more perspective to enjoy. This was no fluke. This was no random lucky lottery that she ended up in the front row seat on the most important day in human history and got to be the first person ever to be sent out with the message of the resurrection and the message of hope to anybody who would need it. Go tell my brethren. Go tell the disciples. And as Mark put it, when she first got sent out by the angel, go tell Peter too. Peter's going to need hope. Peter's going to need to know I'm alive. Peter, why? Because Peter had denied Jesus three times. So Mary got to be the one to tell the whole world for the first time. But long before Billy Graham ever preached it, or Billy Sunday, or D.L. Moody, long before any preacher ever stood up, before the Apostle Paul put it into his epistles, she got to be the one to say, hey, world, Jesus is alive. Peter, I know you feel like a failure, but you can be forgiven. Jesus told the angel to specifically ask about you. And I want to show you what went into the making of this miracle. Epic moment, for sure. But what went into it that poised her and prepared her to be there? What I'm really trying to say is, what can we do now that would prepare us for an epic Easter? Because Mary, she spent from Luke 8 all the way to the end of the gospel getting ready to be in the right place at the right time. And I want us to be poised to do all God's called us to do in this season, in this, in this holy journey, that we would create some runway for all that God has for us in the coming days. So, so what did Mary do? What did Mary do right? Well, first of all, she showed gratitude. That's number one. There's going to be seven. Now, I would preach a shorter sermon 
if she'd have had fewer demons. But I picked one amazing thing about Mary for each of the demons that she originally had. And so number one, she's a person who showed gratitude. And you would be, too, if you had seven demons and then God touched your life. And, and again, the seven demon thing, it, it's not. It's not meant to be just like those are seven demons, like we could picture their names or whatever. Right? You know, It's also, in the scriptures, a symbol for complete or full, right? Seven notes in the musical scale, seven days in the week, seven colors to the rainbow. So this idea of completely, totally, fully given over. So she was fully given over to the kingdom of darkness. The Bible says that the devil is a thief who wants to steal and kill and destroy. He's a liar. So she believed lies, and she, she, she was living fully for the darkness of the enemy, under the control of, of the dark one, until Jesus touched her, until Jesus found her, until Jesus sought her, until he, he healed her and brought meaning to her life and hope to her life. He changed everything about her. And so of course, the, the text says she would use her substance to support his ministry. Of course, you would say, whatever I can do, because she was a grateful person. And grateful people always pivot and seek to be a blessing because they've received a blessing. Gratitude is never silent. It's never invisible. It's never like, well, you don't know my heart. I'm a grateful person on the inside. No, if you're grateful, you'll speak up. If you're grateful, you'll show up. If you're grateful, you'll stand up. She said she didn't just say thanks to Jesus. She said, uh, how can I help? What can I do? How, 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 what, what needs to happen? You guys obviously have needs. It doesn't, it's not free to get the gospel out. You need resources? Great. I can do that. I got gifts. I got blessings. I got resources. You got salvation. I got money. I couldn't save myself, so I'm going to use what I do have to help you. Of her substance, she said, I want more people to be touched like I've been touched. That's gratitude in action. And Jesus always wonders where it is when he's touched someone, but there's not that gratitude in response. And one day, he healed 10 lepers of leprosy. And they all went their way, super excited, fist bumping each other, elbow bumping each other to be, foot bumping each other to be excited, keeping the six foot distance, right? And, and, and one came back and said, Jesus, thank you. And he said, where are the other nine? Didn't I heal, didn't I heal 10? Why is there only one expressing gratitude? Mary was not uh, one of the nine. She, she came back and then kept coming back and then kept coming back. And her whole life, she just continually giving. Spices are not free. She shows up at the tomb. Her arms are full of the most expensive thing in that day you could give. She's like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do more. I know Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus hastily wrapped him. He's going to get wrapped better than that. She spent the whole Sabbath day scheming and planning how she could give even more to Jesus. And early in the morning, through the dark, through the risk, she shows up there with, with more in her hands. Why? She was grateful. And, and we could see it all over her life. Second thing, she showed resilience. She showed resilience. You know, going through something like she went through, being demon possessed, being at her darkest, it would be easy to be defined by that. It would be easy to be your whole life unable to, to, to talk about anything but that. I think we've all been around people who have been brought through something difficult, but they can't get over it. They're defined by it. They're like in a loop, just, just, just constantly replaying the hurts, re replaying the hard times. And it's like you would never know God brought them through something, because it almost seems like they're still stuck in that thing. God gave me the revelation that if he heals my limp, I'm not going to pretend I still have one. I'm not going to be afraid to dance. I'm not going to be defined by it. I want to be like a Mary Magdalene. Yeah, I was, I was fully given over to the devil. I don't know what that looked like, how dark that must have been, how scary that must have been. But you know what? Being around it, you go, you've been through what? There's such a sweetness to you. There's such a brightness to you. There's such an optimism to you. You're not, you're not jaded. You're not snarky. You're not, you're not defined by the hard things you've been through. You're driven by them to then seek out other people and, and be a blessing to them. I like how the Bible says that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego got brought through the fiery furnace. But in fact, their, their story was they didn't even smell like smoke. You could be around them and not smell the smokiness of their trial. May God help us to be a people that you'd have to actually hear our story and hear our testimony go, oh my gosh, because no one ever goes, oh, here comes someone who's been through some hard things. Where it's just evident, go, oh, this is this chip on my shoulder. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. God's good, I guess, maybe to other people. I mean, that was not Mary Magdalene. She, this girl did not have a victim mentality, because you can't be a victim and a victor at the same time. And this girl was more than a conqueror. You know, the word Moses means drawn out. He got his name because he was drawn out of the river. 
He went through such a hard upbringing, as, even as a baby, that the safest thing his parents could do for him was to put him in a crocodile-infested river in a basket. They had a lot of choices. That was the safest choice. He was raised in the home of someone who tried to kill him, had to call his mother nurse and nanny. And the daughter of the person who wanted to kill him more than anybody was who he called mom. Sounds like an expensive therapy bill to me. <laughs> but the name Moses, the name he, he walked forward with the rest of his life, was drawn out. My question to you is, are you allowing your name to be put in? He didn't take his name from, I had to be put in a river. He had his name taken from, I've been drawn out of the river. Yeah, we've been through hard things, but heaven help us to be a people who are called redeemed, yes. called drawn out, called saved, called loved, not called I was forgotten, not called I was neglected, not called I was molested, not called I was abandoned, not called I was divorced, not called I'm a cancer survivor, called. I'm saying, like, let's not, def let's not take our identity from what we've been through, but on who we've been called to. And that's, that's Mary all the way. She was resilient. I also see that she showed her work. She showed her work. Like, like in school, when, when you can't just have the answer because you could have Googled that, they're like, we want to see your scratch paper. Didn't you hate that when you had to turn your scratch paper? Yes. What's the answer? 43. Awesome. How'd you get to that? <laughs> gotcha. I was just going, see, 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 see. You, have to, you want me to see my scratch paper, too. That's a problem. Mary showed, Mary, sh Mary showed her work. In fact, she showed up at work. And that's what allowed her to shine so bright. A little bit about her. Uh, most important thing probably would be to tell you that Magdalene was not her last name. I mean, that's probably a lot of people's confusion. They see Mary Magdalene shut up. You're like, oh, Mary Magdalene, right? A lot of times that happens in the Bible because they had a different culture than we have. Uh, like Jesus, his last name wasn't Christ. Some of you are like, I did not know that. It's not like there was a Mary Christ and a Joseph Christ, so they had a baby, and his name was Jesus Christ, right? Uh, Jesus is his name. Christ is his title, like doctor or pastor or, or governor. Christ is a position spiritually that he came to fulfill, long prophesied that the Christ would come. Uh, where was Jesus from? Jesus was from Nazareth. So he got nicknamed Jesus of Nazareth. Because there was often two ways you would refer to people and distinguish who they were. One would be by who their father was. So often, Jesus would have been called Jesus, son of Joseph. This is Jesus, son of the carpenter. That's how he was known and made fun of often. Is this not the son of the carpenter, right? son of Joseph? right? Uh, or you would be known as the, where you were from. Jesus grew up in Nazareth. It's complicated. Born in Bethlehem, raised in Egypt for a season, eventually claimed Capernaum as his hometown, but technically on paper, Nazareth was his, 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 his city of, of origin. Although if you go to Capernaum today, you'll see on the gates of the city, Capernaum, Jesus' hometown. It's like a little rivalry. It's a little shot at Nazareth. Because even though he grew up in Nazareth, they disowned him. They tried to throw him off a cliff. It was, it's often like that wherever you grow up. It could be that the people closest to you are the ones who don't see the greatness inside of you. And who do you think you are? Dreams of greatness, right? And, and so Jesus, as he began to minister for the first time, they're like, oh, you think you're better than us, basically. By the way, you're not thinking you're better than anybody by seizing your God-given greatness. You're doing everything he called you to do. And so they try and throw him off a cliff. And so Jesus says, fine, I'll hang out in Capernaum when I'm off duty. And so Capernaum is his hometown, even though Nazareth is where he's, where he's known as having grown up. All right, all that to tell you, Mary uh, Magdalene just means Mary from Magdala. Magdala was a city just a, a few miles away from Capernaum. And it was a wealthy city, an affluent city. And their primary export, their primary contribution to the economy was dyes and textiles. So y'all, it, it was the garment district, right? It's so where you want to get some swagged out outfit. You'd, you'd cruise by Magdala, right? So, so Mary Versace is obviously a big part of uh, this community because she's not just called Mary Magdalene. In many parts of the Gospels, she's called Mary the Magdalene. And I read in commentaries this week that basically she became synonymous uh, with the exports of this situation, of this city. She was known for 
the success and affluence of Magdala that made it the posh place to live, right? So this was, this was not you know, Needles, California. This is Beverly Hills, right? Mar Mary lived and, and worked on, on Rodeo Drive, OK? So, so Mary, the Magdalene, which is probably not how you pictured her a minute ago when I said she has seven demons. Because when you think of someone who's got seven demons, you think of someone who's under the bridge, you know, Jones in for heroin. You don't think of someone in the penthouse, but both need Jesus. And, and here she is, not, not you know, wondering where her next meal is going to come from, but she's, she's living large. And in that condition, she was full of darkness. We tend to think that, that those who have made it or have, have success in some regard are, are immune to the, the things that all of us need. But the truth is, many times people get to the top of ladders like that and only, and only to discover that they put their ladder against the long, wrong wall. Mary, it seems, had everything in this world that she wanted, but found out that it was not what she actually needed. So with her success, with these seven demons, someone said seven for each of the seven deadly sins, which, which also includes pride, which also includes vanity. So you think demon possessed, and you go, oh, for sure, foaming at the mouth. No, it could just be full of yourself. And the enemy has control over your heart and control over what you're posting, the, the vanity and the lust and the, the pride of life and all of these things, which is where she was until Jesus touched her, until he changed her. But the cool thing is all that success that, that when she was worshiping money and worshiping herself and given over to sin made her so dark. Now, all of a sudden, when she was saved, those things made her powerful and bright in the light. As she was able to use all that resource to subsidize and finance and support Jesus's ministry, she showed up at work. Even as a Jesus follower, it made what she did so powerful now because she was able to use it for the kingdom of God. She didn't just show her work. She also showed the way for others. She showed the way for others to do what she had done herself. She shows up 14 times in the scriptures. And eight of those times, it's in connection with a list of other women, like the one that we read in Mark's gospel. Oh, yeah, also Salome was there. Also Mary, the mother of James, was there. Uh, we, we read about Susanna, right? She's, she's almost always got a posse with her. Why? Born leader. Why? Influential, magnetic personality, charismatic. I was going to say she, there was a contagiousness about her faith, but felt too soon, honestly. It just, it just, there was like a corona anointing on her, right? Like when you got around her, it, it, you just wanted to be with her. She was one of those people. Many people just have that gift on their life. They have, they have that ability. They're, they have just high woo on the strength finders. It's like, where's that go? I want to go. How's Mary wearing her clothes? I want to wear them that way. She was just a trendsetter and, and influential. And those things were used in a dark way when she was controlled by the devil. But now that Jesus is at the wheel of her life, she's using those things to say, let's serve Jesus together. Come on. You got this blessing. You got that. OK, I'm going to organize this crew. Come on. Where are we going? Doesn't matter. Come on. Susanna? Yes, Mary. Right? It's like, she, she's, she's that way. She's like, We're going. I'm not, if I'm going to church, I'm not going alone. I'm bringing some people with me. If I'm watching on the live link on YouTube, I'm going to send this out to my Twitter phone. You're going to watch too, right? They're just People just wanted to do what Mary did. So she, she, she's using that influence for God's glory. She's using that influence to touch other people. She showed the way. And I love this. She also helped other people see that they could make the devil pay, which is what she did every time Jesus healed someone who was demon-possessed. And she had paid for him to eat lunch that day. Every time she had secured the lodging, every time that she and her friends had worked together to financially continue to make Jesus's ministry possible, she was making the devil pay when someone like her was afflicted by a foul spirit who got touched. I'm telling you, wherever you were at your worst is exactly the place where God wants you to shine the brightest. She had been in a place where she needed help, and now she's going to make other people uh, do the same. OK, so, so I love this so much. One tiny example of it is Joanna, the wife of Cusa. Joanna, the wife of Cusa. And you're like, why did he throw out these details, right? Well, for one thing, when these gospels were being written, you could go to the cities where they were at and find them. These are influential people. Who's Kuza? That's Herod Steward. Herod Steward? Herod Steward? 
Who's Herod? Herod is the king in this little area. Now, he's a puppet king, but he's a king nonetheless. And again, when we read Herod in the Bible, you could be like, the Herods are all over the place. Hundreds of years, like, there's Herod, so many Herods. Here's why. Herod is a title, too. It meant, it meant king. So this specific Herod was Antipas, who was the son of Herod the Great, who was the king when Jesus was born. The same king that tried to kill Jesus when he was a baby, Moses style, and his son Antipas, who's right now currently the king, whose steward was named Cusa, is the same Herod who had John the Baptist's head cut off, Jesus' cousin. And his steward, who managed his real estate portfolio, who was his, his stu- who took care of things for him, no doubt a well-paid, highly placed individual. His wife's a Jesus follower. So follow the money, people. All the money coming from Herod getting funneled through Joanna. She's making generous donations to, to, to Jesus' ministry. How dope is it the dude who cut John the Baptist's head off is helping pay for Jesus' ministry all around the nation? She's showing these women how to follow the way, which is a nickname for Jesus' followers ever since the beginning. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So if you follow Christ, you're following the way. And she's showing them the way and the way to make the devil pay. Beautiful, right? All right. Next, she showed courage. That's number five. Courage to show her face at the cross. When Jesus died, we don't read about Peter being there at the cross. We don't read about Bartholomew being there at the cross. We don't read about, I mean, Thomas? I doubt he showed up. <laughs> These are the jokes, people. <laughs> In fact, there's only one disciple who showed up at the cross, John. And I, I think that preaches pretty powerfully, that someone marked by love was willing to show up. But Mary was there. Mary was there with her, her, her cast of women. And, and they were there. And why was it so dangerous to be at the cross? Why were the disciples locked behind locked doors? Because they thought they were going to be rounded up next to be put to death as accomplices of Jesus. But Mary was fearless. She showed courage to be there. And then seventh, or sixth, rather, she showed emotion. Emotion. I think it's powerful that such a strong leader, such a CEO type, such an alpha female was uh, also someone very in touch with her emotions. She was someone very, very much willing to be vulnerable, willing to be weak. She was so strong on the one hand, yet she's willing to cry publicly, willing to admit I'm hurting. And your power will always be limited if you're not in touch with both sides of that. Can you be strong, but also at the same time be, be weak and admit you're vulnerable, admit you're, you're real, admit things are going down? She's, she's emotionally connected. And all of this is possible because seventh, she showed her true colors. Crisis shows your true colors. When things are not going well, you really, we really get to find out. Going through a hardship, going through a storm, doesn't change who you are. It shows who you really are. It exposes what's really going on. And for Mary, the worst day of her life, when the, the person she had given her life to serve is brutally murdered in front of her, she shows at her core, she's a disciple of Jesus. Take the money away, great. Take my connections away, fine. Take my life, great. Put me on the cross next, fine. I'm going to be here. I'm going to be here for Jesus. He changed my life. He saved my soul. I'm going to give everything I have for him. Where does power like that come from? Two words. My Lord, my Lord. She said, they have taken away to the disciples, my Lord, and I don't know where they put him. My Lord, who is Jesus to you? It's the most important question you will ever answer. She didn't say the Lord. She said, my Lord. That possessive pronoun has the capacity to change everything for you. When he's your Lord, you know the sound of his voice. We're told that Mary finally, and she thought he was the gardener. I love it. When she finally, when she finally meets Jesus on that day, and the front row seat comes full circle, and she meets Jesus who saved her and, and changed her. 
we're told that she was crying outside the tomb because the disciples had gone away. Peter had gone away. John had gone away. But Mary stood at the tomb weeping. Where else is she going to go? This is the last place I knew he was here. I've got the spices still. I'm not going anywhere. Jesus says, who are you, who are you seeking? She turns thinking he's the gardener. And she goes, where'd you put him? <laughs> the, the, the funeral tender, caretaker. Where'd you put him? Did you move him to a different grave? Tell me where he is, and I'll take care of it. Now, the Jews wrapped and embalmed their dead in half of the body weight in spices. So let's assume Jesus weighed 150 pounds. We're talking about a 225-pound mummy. And she says, you tell me where he is. I'll take care of him. Like, what, what do you? I, you know, I don't doubt her a bit. I don't know why she was like worried about the stone. Because when they, the, the women with her go like, how are we going to move the stone? It was like, Mary's like, I got nails. And Joanna, you got them fake lashes on. You could generate wind power, you know? I just love the mama bear that comes out in her. She says to Jesus, where'd you put him? Like, she's like bluff charging Jesus. And he's like, Mary, <laughs> don't fight me. He says, Mary, she instantly dropped to her knees at the sound of Jesus speaking her name. There will be nothing more powerful in your life than your ears being tuned to the sound of your shepherd's voice. John 10, 27, my sheep. Hear my voice, and I know them, and they will follow me. What could be more important than in these days of crisis and trial than us tuning our ears to hear the sound of our shepherd's voice, who each day calls us out and gives us the capacity to follow him? So she, she showed courage and resilience. And she showed the way, and she showed gratitude, and she showed, she, she showed, she showed, she showed. Let's just summarize it this way. She showed up. She showed up. Why did she get the front row seat on this day? Because she was there. She was there. And that is the story of Mary's life. She showed up. She showed up to finance. She showed up to support. She showed up to help. She showed up to praise. She showed up to lead. She showed up to influence. She showed up. She knew what you and I need to know. The show must go on. The, sh the, show, the show must go on. This show, this show, this, this, this spectacle, this display, this impartation, this salvation, the message of the kingdom, it must go on. It must not stop. We must not quit. We must not get discouraged. We must not get tired. The show must go on. Some, so, someone, someone who pays to support a dream, they have, they have VC, in v, the VC world, they, they call that a, an angel an angel investor. An angel steps in, and that's how the, the, the company is able to do what they did. Someone, some, an angel came. An angel came and supported the dream, and now the dream gets to keep going because someone invested in it. Why did, where, do, where do we begin? Why did Mary get an angel encounter? Because she lived her life as an angel investor. And I think even, even more special is knowing the, the origin of that phrase. It, it came not from, from Silicon Valley. It actually started out in uh, Broadway, in New York City, when a play, someone had a story they wanted to see on the stage, was in, in struggle mode. Not enough tickets were being sold. Eventually, everyone will sing the song from that play, but right now it looks like it's going to go under, and the Broadway's going to, like it is now, the whole thing, go dark. And the first use of that phrase was when an angel invested in a story. An angel invested in a play. That was, that was what Mary was. Mary was someone who invested in the story, the story of redemption, the story of salvation continuing to be told. Because what Mary, what made Mary tick and what will always be the strength of our church is belief in this story, the story of Jesus, the story continuing to go up. So let's show up. If Easter is the greatest show, then that's Jesus' job. 
Our job is to tell. Amen? Amen. Father, bless our hearts as we continue in whatever it needs to look like, online, not gathering, in sickness, and in health, in difficulty, in persecution. Father, we believe we were born for this. We were born for these difficult times. We were sent out for just such a time as this. So let our peace, let our fearlessness be an impact to the world around us, God. Let our worship rise. Fill us with your spirit afresh. Give us boldness. Give us faith and give us fire. We pray all this in the mighty matchless name of Jesus. Come on, give God a good amen all across the church. We bow down and confess that you are Lord in this place.
Thanks ever so much for joining us this week. Hope you've enjoyed that first message on Mary Magdalene and uh, there's some more to come over the next few weeks. Hope you have a good week and if you're able to join us on Zoom, if it's Thursday evening, then do so and follow the link. Um, but if not, God bless you. Have a great week and look forward to seeing you again soon. <laughs>